Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome, my friend, to Delling Pool, the podcast brought to you by me, James Delling Pool, and Breitbart. And this week's edition comes from the Master Investor Show in London, which is a fair for retail investors and so I thought I'd talk about money and finance this week with an expert and he's going to either confirm or deny some of my prejudices. <laughs> his his name is Justin Urquhart Stewart. He's a, are you a, is it a fund manager? Is that what you're called? Uh, technically we're stockbrokers. You're a stock, uh, but, okay. but, but a, stockbroker. But a sort of investment manager, those terms vary these days. Seven investment Management um, named presumably after the after the, the the film with Brad Pitt where where she dies at the with the wife gets killed at the end is that right I, th- I was hoping it was more like Snow White but maybe not oh yeah 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 so um, I have this this theory Justin that um, in a parallel world um, after my after I left Oxford and I did the milk round and I got a job in the city. And in this parallel universe, I am now having an incredibly good life, having uh, pr- probably running a hedge fund or something like that. Um, do you think I'm, I'm cut out for this kind of thing from what you know about me, from reading my, my columns and things? I think you're suitably eccentric and opinionated, actually, to do this really rather well. Uh, if you want to be a docile, quiet individual and sit, like, sit in the corner curled up like a mouse, mm. don't go there. Having said that, would you actually have fun doing it? And the answer is, I'm not too sure you would. I think actually the city and financial services industry can be a really rather unpleasant place for many people. Right. You, you mean what you're saying, uh, rather flatteringly, is that I'm not evil enough? <laughs> yeah. I think when you look round, you see things like those hedge fund managers you mentioned, yeah. and there is this popular view that hedge fund managers are all very wealthy and they do very, uh, they're very successful. Yeah. Most fail. Most don't last very long at all. So you actually look at the lifespan of a hedge fund, you'll find it's probably about five or six years. And of course, you'll only hear about the good ones. And of course, the majority of them just disappear without a lot um, of sight. It's true. Who's the, who's the hedge funder who makes loads and loads? The, the, the chap who made billions on, um, on Brexit. What's his name? I'm just trying to think. OD. Oh, Crispin OD. Yeah, yeah, OD. Yeah. Now, yeah. look, look, look. <laughs> he's, my, he's my role model. <laughs> Well, I don't know whether he is, actually. But so he's the exception rather than the rule. Well, he's, he may be exceptional on that, but also the number of times he's made the most appalling decisions the other way as well. Yeah. So it's a bit like going to the races and taking a whole selection of horses. Some you'll win, some you'll lose. It's just you tell your clients the ones you won on. Now, I don't know about what happens when you go to the races, but I very rarely ever come away, on the rare occasion I do go to the races, with any money. Yeah. Um, and I'm afraid the same normally applies to hedge funds. No, no. You use hedge funds for specific reasons. They may be part of your portfolio, and you use them very carefully and selectively. But actually, the term hedge fund manager is just a, a, a subricade for just about anything. Anybody who set themselves up is, I'm going to have a punt on uh, what you know, rainwater running down a, down a pane of glass. Now, there'll, there'll be all sorts of... Some are actually quite defensive some of them are actually quite quite boring but they all have their use what so what what is a hedge fund exactly hmm. well bear in mind the original term hedge fund as the name implies was to hedge against price movements originally it comes about just after the second world war to do with actually the price of grain and vegetables people were actually trying to hedge the price when they were when they were selling few selling forward from that it's now become a term for a fund which does whatever it wants to do and it can be a rather dull fund, or it can be one which takes extreme high risks. Um, and first of all, you have to understand what that hedge fund is actually doing. And it can be absolutely anything. So it's a very, very misleading term indeed. Uh, frankly, I don't think it should be a term for hedge funds. There should be a you know, term of actually saying, this is a fund that does X and takes high risks in the derivatives options market or something like that, or one which is actually really rather dull and actually is purely tra- tracking various areas. You said you'd go into a hedge fund for specific reasons. And so apart from wanting to lose money, what would, what would the other reasons be for going into a hedge fund? Okay, there might be a hedge fund that particularly specialises, say, in the price of oil. And if I wanted to have exposure in my multi-asset portfolio to something which tracked or was able to trade around the oil price, and that particular fund or manager, whatever they like to call themselves, um, it has a reputation of being able to do that and a track record, then I might use that. So very specific areas. Right. So if I think gold is going to go up, 
there are presumably hedge funds out there which could give me a sort of highly leveraged um, entry into the gold market, which could make me a fortune if I'm right in my bet. Is that the kind of thing? That's it. And it would be taking a bet on the person taking the bet. Alternatively, yeah. the rest of us could actually just go and buy gold if we wanted to, either in physical uh, or in, just in terms of something like an exchange-traded fund. Yes, but aren't the clever ways where you can kind of um, exaggerate the strength of your bets and make it even more powerful? I mean, isn't that some kind of trading on the oil markets that the kids in America are doing at the moment? Oh, where they're yeah. Yes, and there are all sorts of ways you can gear this up to yeah. it becomes absolutely and uh, really toxic because what happens is... Toxic or, 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 or great. Oh, if, 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 wonderfully if, powerful. But if you're actually trying to manage the risk of it, and the trouble is the people running these, and we only have to look back to 2008, that people running positions where there were items which turned out to be toxic, but before they were toxic, everyone thought they were incredibly profitable. But because people did not understand the risks that were going on inside, or what happened if the market changed, i.e. really well, could they go wrong, and of course no one believes things go wrong till they finally do therefore actually you've got to be really very careful indeed so you're only using items which you understand not only what the product or what the investment is but what the various alternative actions are of that investment if stuff changes and good heavens in the past year we've seen enough stuff change we we certainly have i mean these markets at the moment i've been i've just been reading a book about this um uh they're about the most difficult ever, aren't they? Because because the whole system has been corrupted by things like quantitative easing and and all these these um, uh, um, central bank interventions and so on. It's not it's not natural anymore. Well, it, it's not natural, and the various things have gone on. One, you look at the basic economics, and you won't find this in an economics book. So when I go and give a lecture at, say, a business school or something like that, and they're talking about the various types of economics, and QE, and the way we've been going on about QE, has not been in the economics uh, list of the areas to learn about, because it didn't happen before, not in this form. Then you've had interest rates dropping down in such a way over the past 25 years. We've had this bull market in, in bonds, which most people, most people in the public don't understand what you're talking about. But we've seen rates coming down so that now what were always known as the risk-free assets, you know, the 10-year gilt, the 10-year um, treasury, aren't risk-free. They're now actually really rather risky. So that everything that was, this is the way you do it. As you get older, you need more fixed interest, you need yes. more government gilts and treasuries. So when you retire, you'll be actually not fine. You'll now have a portfolio of risky assets, not safe assets. Everything is top to tail. What, what does it mean, um, the bull bull market for bonds. Yeah, yes, there are ways of describing bulls and bullocks and things like that. Um, but basically what has happened here, as you've actually got yields coming down, the price of the underlying bond goes up. So for 25 years, the basic yields on government treasuries and government gilts have been coming down. So those prices of those gilts have been steadily rising, which is very nice. If those yields should start rising, and for years everyone said, yes, but that's not going to happen. Well, last summer it did. Those yields have started going up, and so now the capital value of those bonds has started to come down. So a lot of people, it's often quite old, often retired people, with big portfolios of government gilts, because that's what they were told by the advisors to do 20, 30 years ago, yeah. are now sitting on things which are really rather risky. So, but, so the yield is how much these bonds pay out Per, per year? Per year. So it's, it's, their, it's their, their dividend. So it's, so, it's, so it's your income. So you're, so you're getting, so the more income it pays out, the less the actual price of the bond. Is that right? And it's a proportion of that value. So your yield will vary according, if, as, as the price is changing, your, your, your yield will be changing. You'll still be getting the same amount coming off it. But of course, what's happened is, is as yield is being down because it's how it's being traded, the actual capital value will either go up or down. So if your capital value is going down, you're doing that over 20, 30 years, you started off with a and you suddenly find yourself now down to in your 80s with something which is now half a million and you have no means of being able to get that back you've been sold a real dog what you can't you can sell the bonds but they're, but they're, they're worth half what you they were half what you got and yeah. in, in the meantime you know you don't have any real mechanism to actually try and create wealth again really what we've got to do now is because the other thing that's changed and there are very many as you were saying because the demographics have changed. We're now, instead of actually working till 65 and then work, then living another five, 10 years and popping our clogs, we've now got another 30 years. So the pensions were designed for that. So the pension funds don't work anymore. Um, and so now you actually have to find another way of funding yourself for another 30 years. So when you retire, rather than having a defensive portfolio, you're actually going to have to have a, actually a growth portfolio to see you through another 30 years at least. Yes. And that's a fundamental change. When is the, I, I, I don't know how to, how to ask this any other way, but 
when's it all going to kick off? When is the shit going to hit the fan? Because it is, isn't it? There's, there's going to be re- the day of reckoning when, when the bond market does terrible things and uh, we haven't got... I mean, there's so much debt, isn't there? Can you explain what, okay. what, what's... What's happened... I mean, basically, over the past few years, we've then had this situation where governments have just been producing debt. Um, and how do they produce debt? Well, it's their central bank and the government to get together. They create the money. They turn into government bonds. The, effectively, in our case, the Bank of England owes all these bonds, and the government pays the Bank of England, which is the government, in effect, uh, the dividend. So it all goes round in a circle. Welcome yeah. to La La Land. Yeah. Now, we've built up all this debt. Two things can happen. One... You either start introducing inflation, and lo and behold, what's happening now, inflation erodes the value of debt, erodes the value of assets. Um, And so you've actually got to be really rather careful. So therefore, governments quite like inflation. So therefore, year by year... You say quite like, they they very like it. Oh, they love it, but they can't go out and actually say so. So just very nice, a little bit of... The trouble is with a little bit of inflation, uh, you're liable to end up with a little bit, lot more inflation. So you've got to be really careful indeed. The other thing, of course, that you're dealing with this is that actually this de- debt is often reasonably short-dated. So at the end of it, when it rolls off, you don't repay it. You don't actually have to actually... You, the government just cancels it. So it just ends up just disappearing. And so you wash it away and wash it away. But it takes a long time to do that. So actually you don't... Because all you're doing is who you're repaying. The government? Well, the government owns it. So effectively you're just crossing it out in the end. So the government's sort of borrowing money and then writing off its own debts, more or less. You're right. It's a charade. And the, but we're living with this charade, and it's just finally, so long as everyone believes in the charade, it can carry on. This is it. It's like aeroplanes. They only carry on flying as long as everyone on board believes, believes that, that the wings are going to work and that the aerodynamics are going to keep it up in the air and everything. But, but I, I suppose in this case, a bit like the planes, as long as you've actually got some engines as well. Yeah. And it's a bit like having a fiat currency, you know, our, our paper currencies. You know, I promise to bear the bearer uh, one pound, says the Bank of England note. Well, of course they don't. Um, because we don't actually have the assets to back it up. It's on the basis we believe in it. When I go back to my old Roman coins, which I'm much happier playing with, uh, and I've got those made of proper gold, and they're backed up by the actual value of the gold, assuming the emperor hadn't devalued them in the meantime. meantime. You mentioned earlier that that QE has never been really done before, and it's not in the economic textbooks, except we know from looking at history, it's been tried loads of times, the debasing of of the coinage under the Romans. Again, I've, I've got... In my in my possession, a um, a long cross penny from Edward the yes. reign. Yes. And the reason it's called a long cross penny is because there's a cross which goes right to the edge of this silver coin. And the reason it's there is is to prevent it being clipped, people snipping off the ends. And you can see how how big the coin is from the, from the the length of the cross. Um, and every time in history, I mean, I, I don't know much about finance, but I do know a bit. Uh, the sort of catastrophic end of things, is every time it's been tried, it's it's comp- it's ended in disaster. The debasement of the of the coinage. We we saw what happened. What the hyperinflation caused in in Spain Germany. and Portugal yep. um, it, when they were bringing back lots of gold from from South America. Yeah, we've seen Weimar. Yeah, we've seen uh, uh, Zimbabwe. We've seen Argentina. Yes, they, they went through similar they, issues. Yeah, they've so. Um, it's only a matter of time, isn't it, before this stuff happens to us? Well, the answer is how long, and this is all to do with the, the, the modern economy, is based on confidence. Is it actually a confidence trick? And the answer is it is a form of trick, because if we're all willing to go along with it, therefore the value is still maintained. The value of your house has a value because someone's willing to buy it. If you live in central London, is your crummy little Victorian house actually worth that series of noughts has got at the end of it, realistically in terms of brick, land and cement? The answer is no. But it's worth that because there is a perceived idea that someone else is going to buy it at that price. And whilst we all go along with it, it's okay. One day it will come to an end. But none of us can actually forecast that because if you do forecast it and live to it, um, then actually you'll end up with a self-fulfilling promise for you, if not necessarily for anybody else. Yes. Well, I wanted to talk to you in in a later section about about how, as an an investor, one plays this horror. Because on the one hand, I think... It's all so dangerous. I want to put all my money into physical gold um, to preserve my, what little of my wealth I have. And at the same time, I'm looking out there and seeing what the markets are doing under Donald Trump. The uh, what was it called? The Trump pump. pump. The Trump. The Trump pump. Yeah. Um, Followed by a Trump dump, no doubt. But 
it, it's going to happen, isn't it? But that that won't necessarily be, be be Trump's fault any more than the Trump pump was. It was it was just a, a sign of confidence, I think, wasn't it? After well, and we're we're seeing exactly this at the moment. You know, it's a, we're, the market's gone up very enthusiastically on what Mr. Trump could possibly provide by putting uh, tax breaks and other elements through Congress. Uh, this morning, we've actually just had the news that he couldn't get the anti-Obamacare policy going through and some concern that he couldn't necessarily get other policies through. And therefore, the phony war we've seen for the past few months of actually the promise of what might come may not happen, in which case pump could easily turn into dump. Can I just have a quick digression into politics there? Um, I'm... I see a very, very one-sided analysis of Trump um, in, in Britain at the moment. Mm. It's like everyone takes their, their version of events from the BBC and they look at Trump and they look, and they look at um, the, the health care and they say, Trump has failed. Look, he ha- had one job and he failed, he failed to do it. Um, they seem to forget that Trump is, and I don't, I don't want to sound like his, his PR man here, but it seems to me that there's not enough open-mindedness about, about, about who he is and what his aims, aims might be. For example, he is fighting a battle, not just against the, the Democrats, but also against the GOP establishment. Mm. And I think the reason that that health care bill failed was because it was a, a Paul, Paul Ryan invention, which actually a lot of Trump voters and a lot of natural conservatives didn't want because it was just another version of uh, Obamacare too, really, mm. just designed to favour certain interest groups. The kind of crony capitalism that 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 Trump has come into the White House to try and get rid of. Well, I think it's fascinating when you actually think about it. Is take away all the emotion of Mr. Trump and the caricatures that go with it, all of which are very amusing and uh, very entertaining. Actually, what you're trying to do is uh, you're seeing a, a regime which is actually trying to put some realism in here. And the realism is actually to say, um, now, can we actually run this country on a much more sensible business-like manner rather than necessarily actually just perpetuating the continuous rise in debt, which cannot be afforded? And the growth of government. Yes, well, and the same, government. same thing. Yeah. Um, and the trouble is, I think, you know, it's, it, it, the caricature has now outgrown the story. The logic behind this is actually very sensible. And the problem is, therefore, then you actually get the media uh, giving you an angle one side without actually giving you a better ideas really what's going on which is the American economy is doing quite well Uh, the American economy is in really not bad shape but the government position in terms of its finances and its outlet for managing such the world's largest economy is a mess and it needs reform and sorting out but the problem is this the Constitution means that the president isn't that strong yeah. He's, he's only got executive powers. It's designed to prevent a despot running it. That was the original concept of the Constitution. Hence, you've then also got the tripartite control, not just with the judiciary uh, and also with the Congress, but of course it's not just tripartite. There is actually a fourth pole to it as well, which of course is the Fed. Um, and so what you've actually got is the ability to try and bring some realism. And it's actually the Fed, I would like to think, could be the base of actually providing more of that realism to it. What, by, by, commi- by committing suicide? <laughs> well, by actually Do you not believe that the Fed should be ended? Uh, the Fed needs reform, but the, where the Fed... Not destruction. Well, the thing of what it did do, you, I think, where it was really useful was in 2008. In 2008, when we had actually had a Bank of England, which has lost its entire knowledge because Governor Brown, because Gordon Brown had taken the knowledge of the Bank of England and given it to the FSA. The FSA became the Free Syrian Army. We've now got the FCA. The FCA doesn't have the knowledge of how to reform banks. We know how to actually reform banks. You take out the bad debt, you put it on one side, put a sign on it saying 20 years, come back then, and by the way, you bank are paying for it, and the, the surviving bank continues. And the Americans did that very effectively. Britain did not, which is why still, 10 years later, we're sitting there with a near bankrupt RBS, which is still not fit for purpose, and the other banks still pretty hampered. Uh, So the Bank of England lost its knowledge. Where the Fed did have that great expertise of looking at the problem and identifying this is actually what we need to be able to do. So I wouldn't want to lose that expertise. Other areas you can criticise. But hang on, Justin. The the, the Fed bailed out Goldman Sachs. Ah, now you've actually got another issue here, which is then the the interweaving of government and uh, and Wall Street. And when you actually did see Mr Trump actually trying uh, trying to drain the swamp um, as he was referring to Washington, but by bringing in his Goldman Sachs connections again, I suggest he's actually adding alligators rather than draining the swamp. Um, to that extent, it worried me that we weren't moving on. We were going back to the old Goldman Sachs mechanisms of actually trying to protect the status quo of uh, the US investment banks. I mean, you're with me on this point. You? Goldman Sachs are just evil. Well, I mean, just, just beyond evil. Any organisation 
which can not only provide a service to its clients and then provide a service against the bets it of those clients. It bets against its own clients. You know, how is that even is, legal, is Justin? It's fundamentally wrong. How it, how, so explain to me. Uh, why are these people not in prison for doing that? Why is that not illegal? I, I have to say, I have absolutely no idea, but my only excuse is that's one of the reasons I had to leave the bank I was with. This is going to be the next section of the programme, why I totally effing well hate um, so much of the finance sector. You, you accept it, obviously, but mm. we, we, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, you are listening to my, my special lovely friend. You're listening to me, James Dellingpole, on the Dellingpole podcast, brought to you by... Breitbart with my special guest, Justin Urquhart Stewart. Check out the official Breitbart store today. Store.breitbart.com is the home for the brand new official Breitbart store. Head there now for products for women and men, like t-shirts, baseball tees, tank tops, hoodies, and hats, or an unapologetically American belt buckle. Store.breitbart.com has these items and many more. So get your gear now at store.breitbart.com. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to Delling Pool, the podcast with me, your very good friend, James Delling Pool, brought to you by Breitbart. Um, I'm at the Master Investors Fair in London, which is a trade fair for them yeah a trade fair for for retail investors i.e that's ordinary punters like me who want somehow to preserve their assets and not live in penury in retirement and stuff like i'm probably going to and i'm talking to justin urquhart stewart um who i think is going to tell me in a moment that he's actually one of the good guys but i do think that generally people in the financial sector are complete scum sucking <laughs> tossers um and i'll give you i'll give you some examples of this i've noticed as you know, I went to a, a very fine university, and I look at some of my contemporaries who went to lesser universities, like, I don't know, Bristol or, 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 or wherever. Sorry, where, where were you, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> and I notice a lot of them got, got really cushy jobs in the city and ended up earning way more than I do, even though they're not on my intellectual mm. level. And they did stuff that I would consider really bad. Let me give you one example. Um, one of my friends, I won't name his name, was involved in helping to invent collateralized debt obligations, oh. which is just like, it seems to me, it's like getting a dog turd from the pavement, wrapping it up in, in shiny paper, and then spraying it with gold paint, and then selling it to your customers saying, look at this shiny thing with delicious contents, which we can't, we can't tell you about but actually all we can say is that they're really really good and but they uh, are eco-friendly ag again <laughs> my question here is how is this shit even legal how can they how can how can bankers be allowed to create toxic products and then sell them to other people without without and you being and punished you only have to look at how many people have gone to prison in america more Britain, I think so far one, maybe two, um, over this whole series of, not just that, but a whole series of scandals that we've had. It's not regarded as a crime. It is a crime. It is a form of theft, deceit, well, however want you, we want to try and call it. I st I'm a failed lawyer. The reason I ended up doing this is I was the world's worst barrister. Right. Um, and I was told by my pupil master training as a barrister that there was more money in crime than defending it. So quite <laughs> obviously, it was a career in financial services, yes. which was a proper <laughs> crime. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, I realized that the world of the barrister was a bit of a closed shop to start with. Um, yeah, lawyers are damn nearly as bad as... Oh, well, as, I mean, no, as because as barristers, you, you couldn't talk about money because that was distasteful. Um, and you didn't uh, actually go and chase any money fees. So other people had to pay you. You couldn't sell anything. You couldn't do it. And when you got bored, you just reverted to Latin. Um, and it was a, it was a closed shop. Um, and I, I hated it because you weren't creative. I required, my career depended, was dependent upon you having a problem. And frankly, the bigger the problem you had, the happier I was. That's not a career. That's just dreadful. Uh, when joining financial services, I actually went into international trade banking, old-fashioned stuff. How do you move goods from A to B? This is in Africa and the Far East. And that was nice and constructive, and you really think you were part of the economy. 
But I came back to London just before uh, Big Bang, Baby Bang and all those sort of things. And I got involved in the, in the stockbroking world then. And my first sniff of this was actually looking at uh, um, friends and colleagues who were in this. And this old word pre-Big Bang, which now people look at with slightly sort of glazed eyes and saying they were the worlds of gentlemanly capitalism. And it wasn't. Yes. It was a corrupt cartel which had painted a, an air of, uh, of glory around them and history, which actually didn't exist either, yeah. because you had a world which was stockbrokers, um, and basically they were the same stockbrokers until they got hammered, which was only after lunch. Um, then you had the, the effect of the wholesalers, the, you know, the, 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 the jobbers, market makers, uh, and then you had the investment bank, uh, bank banks, of those days known as merchant banks. They had fixed commissions. You couldn't negotiate your commissions. Some would say fixed prices as well. And in those days as well, we had originally 45 stock exchanges in Britain. Now, most of them were fairly useless. There were 45 in 1945. We got down to seven of them. Um, but eventually London closed them all down. And they closed them all down because the whole thing was based on the number of transactions. I, how many transactions could you get out of a client? Could you churn the client's portfolio? You were based, your commission, your bonus was based on the number of transactions you did. If you did 20 purchases, 20 sales in a year, you got a bonus. How's the client's portfolio? I've no idea, but you did 42. Good, you're in, that's fine. That is no way to so, run up. No so business. it's about skimming, skimming off the top of every trade. Absolutely. You, you get your job. Your, your, One yeah. of my first jobs as a sort of junior when coming out, sort of uh, a broker, was hearing the senior partner coming in saying, gentlemen, of course, it was gentlemen because there were no women then. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, uh, I want uh, one. I want two clad, two trades per client, please. To which I thought, oh, well, that's an instruction. I didn't. Wasn't until a bit later I realised, what do you mean? He just effectively just wants to do two trades to earn two commissions out of every client across the whole book, irrespective of whether they need it or not. Yes, he was churning it. Now, of course, not only as I said, is this was this all blokes? This was all white blokes. This was, a, this was sexist, it was racist, it was also divided by religion. You had Jewish houses, Catholic houses, Protestant houses, and if you didn't have to know which one you were in and which, which way you felt you were leaning, your career could only go so far. But the worst thing, typically British, it was classist. So if you had white socks and came from the east end of London, your career was very simple. It was in the back office, which was either in the basement or the attic. It couldn't go any further. Now, come Big Bang, all of that changed. The American yeah. money came in, and so now it became a meritocracy, and it went from one extreme to the other. So now we have people who can uh, earn according to their talents, but talents which were necessarily then often out of control, so we have people trading, earning commissions, earning uh, huge amounts yeah. of bonuses, and it didn't matter where they came from this time. Uh, you could uh, come from any background, which was good news, but people running the business didn't understand it, and that's where the root causes of the next bust was coming from because it was run by a bunch of old farts who really didn't understand what was going on and so people trading out of control, earning huge amounts of money and it was the client who was being ripped off underneath it. But nothing's really changed, has it? I mean, I mean what are these people actually doing? What value are they creating in order to justify their massive, massive salaries? I mean, I, I, I look, at, look at my contemporaries. Who are the ones who are absolutely minted? They are, well, I suppose the second tier from the very top is uh, the people who've joined city law firms and are now partners. Mm. But at the very top are people who work in, in finance. And what I'd like to ask you is, what do these people do for their money? It's just, are they not reliant on the fact that most of us outside the city don't really know what finance is about and, don't, and, and haven't really understood what a complete contract is? Uh, because if we did, wouldn't we be marching on to, with, with pitchforks? Something is very strange has happened. Sometime in the 80s, these packages, because people moved away from salaries, they suddenly had packages of all these other bits they got, went from reasonable numbers to astonishing numbers, yeah. and I can't try, quite track where that happened. Um, why did it occur? Well, it came directly over from the States, we could see that. It was coming through the investment banks. Now, add to that uh, a not-fit-for-purpose financial services industry on the retail side in the UK, because in the UK, where did you go to for your advice? Most people wouldn't know what a stockbroker looked like, some silly getting red braces, maybe, yeah. but they wouldn't have come across them. A lot of them would have come across an IFA, but in this country in those days, they weren't very high and probably provided FA. You had the uh, insurance companies providing pensions and they weren't operating in such a covert manner that you had no idea how your pension was actually doing. And the banks were flogging products, which of course turned out to be fairly toxic a little bit later. Yeah. I'm surprised anybody's got any money at all. So the retail end of the market was discrediting itself. Meanwhile, the investment side of it was effectively building up its own world with no one questioning it. 
Yeah. And so where was the challenge? And no one was to turn around and say, this is wrong, you're paid too much, because who was to say that they were actually wrong at that stage? No one was identifying the underlying problems and justifying their pay. Can we just go back in time to, first of all, to the beginning of this podcast and then, and then back in my, in my time when I'm doing those milk round interviews? Um, would there have beca- had I gone into the city, would there have come a moment fairly early on where I realized that I was in an industry creating nothing of any real value and that my job really was to um, milk this corrupt system either by inventing um, ridiculous new products like, like collateral, collateralized mm. debt obligations or by, by ripping off, off clients or by uh, skimming off, off, off uh, I don't know, um, uh, corporate finance maybe trying to sort of rip companies off for, for, with, with ludicrously infa- inflated fees. I mean, is there, is there anybody in the city really who is not ultimately morally corrupt? Because people joined in with the system, they therefore assumed that that was the acceptable way to operate and behave. Yeah. Take the LIBOR scandal, for example. Yeah. LIBOR scandal was something that everybody knew was going to happen. You established the rate in London by phoning round half a dozen to a dozen jolly good chaps to establish what their rate is for the day. And whilst you've got good, reliable chaps, that's going to be okay. Well, of course, let's not live in uh, fool's uh, paradise. But actually, of course, you're going to be dealing with people who are going to be there for their own benefit. And therefore, if they put in their own rates, but they're playing the game as far as they're concerned. No one's telling them that's wrong. They're just using the system. So there was no one there to actually say, this is the wrong way to behave. Did anyone actually have their moral compass out and say, I'm sorry, this is not right. And the answer is, no, they didn't, because they were far too happy to go along with it. Their bosses didn't, because some of them, A, didn't understand it, and B, didn't question it, because they were making money. Who was going to turn around and say the emperor is somewhat sartorially challenged? It was only on occasions when people turn around and say, I'm sorry, this is not acceptable, this has just gone far too far, and you step away. In which case, the rest of them say, by all means, step away, we're carrying on. Prove it that we're wrong. Let me give you an analogy. Um, The other day... I had an incredibly minor bump in my car. I mean, it was so trivial as to make no difference apart from there was a, there was a scratch which needed doing. And it was a um, somebody, a friend of mine, bumped into me um, in the road outside my house, and I thought this is fine. We'll deal. We'll deal with it very, very quickly. We'll go through the insurance system. Um, and I found myself sucked into this vortex of of corruption this the, the whole system of institutionalized corruption I, I would say for example i was encouraged by my insurance company to hire a very expensive grossly unsuitable replacement car for the duration of my car being having its door fixed which amazingly took like about eight days so this operation which could have been conducted by a, a bodywork specialist in a day instead took eight eight days meanwhile i was i was um hiring renting this car from a, a, an expensive hire company at a rate that i would never have paid myself i i, I mean i would have, i would have probably hired a, a you know a, 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 a really cheap car hmm. as i always do when i when i hire a car um so already you've got this system which which is designed to benefit the insurance company which is designed to uh, uh, presumably the, the bodywork company is charging an inflated rate on it and then after this, I get a call from um, a call centre in, in Bombay or, or wherever somewhere advising me that I'm eligible for a, a, a payout because I may have sustained whiplash <laughs> injuries and I could make yeah. maybe five or, 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 or ten grand. And you have a conversation with these people because you're kind of curious initially, kind of like, well, how? What's going on here? And they almost persuade you that actually it's only fair because you may have suffered some kind of injury and actually this, this, this money is totally legit, totally kosher. Mm. Lots of people take the money because, because, hey, they're not doing anything strictly illegal. But at the back of their minds, they know that they've done something morally wrong, as indeed they have. Mm. Now, most people, given that temptation, five, ten grand of free money, say yes. And I'm wondering, is this analogous to what goes on in the city? People sort of... Early on, they think maybe it is a bit dodgy, but everyone else is doing it, therefore it's the way things are done. Well, everyone else is doing it, and more to the point, my bosses have told me I could do it. 
And I've also got a compliance officer, which isn't telling me I That's can't do it. The compl- yeah. So therefore, I've ch- you know, I've t- if, is he the one or she the one saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing that? Then, OK, I'll take notice. But if they're not telling me, that's fine. And the problem was, and you saw this specifically as these products got more and more complicated, is only those people actually operating those products actually understood what was going on. The, the Lords and Masters, we didn't expect them to understand. But the people who were supposed to be checking, the watchdogs, the guard dogs, they didn't know. And so who is therefore going to act against it and say, well, I'm going to blow the whistle on this because I think it's wrong. Morally, you'll be right. But actually, are you going to sit there and say, well, perhaps I'm, perhaps I am, perhaps I'm wrong. I'm the one. I'm the minority. When actually people need the courage of their convictions to be able to turn around and say, this, you know, actually, this does not make sense. It is illogical. And we've seen too many examples of this. And we need to therefore have some more examples where good guys can win. Good guy doing the right thing and that would have to say, if it sounds corny, it was the first line of my business plan, doing the right thing, yeah. then at least you can say, fine, anything else I may get wrong, I may screw up the investments, I may screw up the money transfers, I may you know, be unfortunately rude to one or two people, but at least I'm doing the right thing. I can sleep at night. Yeah, but isn't being the good guy in the city a, a bit like being a, 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 a gentle Sufi Muslim in, in Raqqa? <laughs> I mean, isn't that the, all, you, all, you, all that happens is you get your head chopped off? Yeah, well, so how can the system accommodate anyone or, who's decent? Or being the wuss at school, yes, yeah, so the one as opposed to the hard nose. No, I don't think actually that's true. Um, I can quite understand how that can be the case. No, I think there is a, a way in which you can actually do things the right way, show people up and say there is a wrong way of doing it. That may mean they may actually, so heaven forfend, actually make more money for, them, for, for their clients on occasions because they're taking bigger risks or doing something strange I don't understand. But as far as I'm concerned, I can actually then turn around over the longer term, which is what I'm doing. Ah, I thought you were going to be all right. You're one of the good guys, is what you're telling well, me. You know, I mean, it is just pure. I suppose was it out of fear or was it out of conscience? No, it was actually out of anger that I left. I left Barclays in the end because I was just so angry with what they were doing. Barclays, by the way, was the company I I went. I got to the second stage of the milk round. Right. Um, so I, I could have been you, Justin. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not your model. So sure. much, so much richer. Imagine, ah. imagine <laughs> that I, I would have had a, a swimming pool. I'd have had um, stables for my hunters. I'd have had a groom and an undergroom. But sorry, carry on. But the result of it is, I have to say, actually, yes, I, I could have earned a lot more money had I stayed in doing that. Um, because, like the Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, I mean, it's the Wolf of Wall Street. You know, I could easily now charge my clients a lot more and they would never know. I could adjust the spreads. I could in- increase internal costs and charges, which I might have to disclose at some stage. But I could add probably another 5 to 10%. It would be invisible. And I could make a lot more money, and I could have a really oh, a huge house in the countryside, which I don't have. Um, but that's the wrong way to behave. And I would like to think, and this is when I press into it forward in the industry, there is a right way to behave, and I'm happy to fire staff who don't join in with that. And I've had one or two over the years who just say, oh, well, you're just being you know, a bit nauseating over this, and no, actually, we've got to go out and make money. I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. You go. There is a right way to behave. And they, if they don't want to join in with it, I'm sorry, you can go find somewhere else. Can I ask you uh, your opinion on the Sage of Omaha? Because I know a lot of people revere Warren Buffett, but I've also heard from some quarters that, yeah, he used to be one of the good guys. He used to uh, uh, use the value investment techniques he picked up from who was his, his, the guy who taught him. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, no, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Our, our Alzheimer's is, is kicking mm. in. But, but that, that more recently he's become part of the system and that he, he gets deals that no ordinary person could get. So he, so he get his his privileged relationship with government. He's essentially well, bought into the corrupt system. Just look what he did with Goldman Sachs. He got a spectacular deal banking Goldman Sachs during the difficult times, where you know he could just about charge what he liked, and made sure that the vampire squid survived to another day, and uh, did extremely well out of it indeed. Um, now then, also most recently in the United Kingdom, we've had his support of the failed bid coming in for Unilever from Kraft. Um, and so suddenly people were associating you know, Buffett with the other uh, attackers from Kraft coming in. And of course, actually, they're very different characters. Interesting to see most recently he's been rowing back on that and trying to say, no, actually, I'm not part of these people who are glorified asset strippers. Um, and uh, saying, actually, I'm going back to my old ways. Unilever, by the way, sucks, doesn't it? The, the, well, guy, the guy who who's in charge of that at the moment, what's his name? Yeah, uh, it begins with S. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> yes, <sir>. Smelly. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he's uh, just ghastly, politically correct. Yeah. Um, and, and it's again, that's a bit of it's a, it's a veneer because what he's trying to do is make Unilever holier than thou. 
because Unilever, of course, is a huge combine. But it does have a slightly different attitude to, say, someone like Kraft. It does take a longer-term view, as a lot of Europeans... Yeah, it's slightly less evil than Kraft. Yeah, that's the, you, yeah, yeah, great. Uh, but the, some of its products are still just as bad, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but so it, we're talking a sort of, sort of uh, a tiger shark as opposed to a great white, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm sensing a theme here. The, this is just like... A giant swamp. Yeah. So what we need to be able to do, and this is the, the, the crucial element, we need to teach people, before people go near the alligators, actually to, to get them to understand about water and swamps. At school in this country, we don't teach people finance at all. We, uh, when it comes to mathematics, we teach them strange things about you know, uh, how to actually sort of calculate. No, of course, they won't do alg algorithms these days or anything like that. But I love the way it be. People refer to slide rules. When was the last time you saw a slide? Yeah, but you made a point earlier on about the, the, the thing about the fox and the hen and the grain and they had to be transported across the well, river. The, the in, old, it was in the a old boat. logic thing. Yes, you had a chicken, a ham sandwich and a fox. Yeah. And you were by the side of a canal and you got a little rowing boat. And you've got to get them across the canal without them all devouring each other. I suppose the ham sandwich doesn't devour yeah. anybody. Um, and this was the logic you were supposed to try and work out because that will no doubt help you in later life. And I don't know about you, but as yet I've never been next to a canal with a boat, with a ham sandwich, a chicken and a fox. Why did no one yes. actually say to me, no, yeah, there's an opportunity. It might yeah. be a lovely sunny afternoon when I was sitting there chatting to a fox. Actually, what someone should have said is, Justin, you're going to have three children. You're going to put them through university. You're going to be retired for far too long. How much money do you need? To which I would have gone, I have absolutely no idea. Good. Find out. You're, you're so right. I wish somebody had said that to me at school. Um, well, and so if done that, one of the things I've done recently, and it's funny, our industry couldn't do this. We've actually some of our clients, they're uh, software games writers. You mean, have you heard of Donkey Kong? Goldeneye? Yes. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. We're of an age. I don't. But, <laughs> but Don Donkey, Donkey, Donkey Kong, Kong is ancient history yeah, now, ancient but, uh, but uh, they're probably very rich. Yeah, they are very rich indeed. But they're geeks. Okay, they're older geeks, elder wealthy geeks. They looked at what we did and they said, that's rubbish. You know, here's your pension, here's your ice, and it doesn't mean a thing to them. You suddenly realize that people think in, w in games, they think about things in a different way. Yes. So we said, right, okay, sit down, come on, we're going to have a little joint business on this. We want you to write your pension world in, in your world, sorry, our pension world in your world. What does your pension, your ISA, your investment account look like to someone in a software game? The answer is it looks like a donut, and it explodes, and it makes rude noises. And so it's suddenly, it's suddenly your pension, your investments, Look at something that's vaguely interesting. You can't make it entertaining, they'll make it interesting. Now the next stage I've told them to do, I said, now tell me the future on a tablet. So you put in your own information with your family, and you make up your family, and you, so it works out when you're going to die. You can move your death. You can move other people's deaths. Don't tell them, but you can do it. And then put in, it'll then calculate, put in your, the, the tax. It's got all the basic tax information in there. It tells you when you run out of money. Not when you're 60, but when you're 80, when you're 90. That's what you need to know. It doesn't tell you what the answer is. It tells it's you what the problem is. Isn't it? Then you can sort it out. Now, if we can make it engaging and interesting, then at least actually we'll go somewhere. That way, people will sit there and say, I don't need that dodgy pension from that dodgy advisor, from that alligator, because actually I know what I need, and it's not that. It's actually quite straightforward, because it's not that complicated. Yeah, I think if we looked into our finances, we'd all be so depressed, we'd top ourselves, which, mind you wouldn't be a bad move because it would save us having to worry about our pension. The alternative single flight to Zurich is a variation, I think, on people's financial plan. I, I fear desperately, when you think about it, what's the figure? It's less than £30,000 people have got, on average, in this country in a pension pot. That's not the income, that's the total pot. In terms of income, that's going to get you pence. So people aren't doing it. And you hear people saying, oh, I'm, I'll win the lottery. You know, and it, this is just childish It's stuff. a good strategy. It is. Well, I would actually if, have... If, if, if it, turns if it turns out, <laughs> I have the lottery in a single flight to Zurich, and that's about it. But no, if you there's one lovely figure. I remember this one. This is actually one figure I did get from BZW years ago. If Granny had given you 100 quid 71 years ago, you'd now have in the FTSE, and the same applies in the S&P and the DAX and things, around about £9,000, whoopee. If Granny had given you 100 quid 71 years ago, not only this, but invest, invested in that, but reinvested the dividends, yes. what would you have? Not 9000 double, treble, not 9000 but 190000 190 really? just from the dividends just, just the dividends just compounding you can't get duller than that you don't need a silly getting red braces to do that if only our grannies had done all those sort of things before you wouldn't need the average rate of return would be pretty small um, and but you, so you don't need huge amounts you need time yeah and if someone can tell you that as soon as possible yes then you've got a reasonable chance of having enough yeah yeah you are listening to the Delling Pole podcast with me 
James Dellingpole and my special guest, Justin Urquhart-Stewart. We're talking finance and we're going to have one more section in a moment. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Paul in Connecticut, welcome to the show. And I'm tired of, of banging my head against the wall and every time you turn around, there's somebody else picking your pocket. It's insurance, it's taxes, it's regulations. I'm so sick of it. All they do is they hammer the people that want to get out there and do something every day, and they reward the people that stay home and do nothing. It's, I'm, I'm beyond done with it. I'm, I've had it. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pole, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Dellingpole. Welcome back, my lovely friend, to the final part of Dellingpole, the podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my special financial advisor friend, Justin Urquhart Stewart. Um, Justin, I couldn't help noticing from your name, Justin Urquhart Stewart, that you might be from north of the border. You might be a Scot. Am I right? That's true. We don't all have to sound like Rob Roy. No. But why are, why are so many Scots involved in the financial industry? Is it because you're, you're canny? I'm uh, probably unemployable elsewhere. Um, th- yeah, I don't know. Um, I have uh, no idea at all. But certainly there's a, there's a proportion of the population in Scotland, more people are involved in financial services than, than anything else. And now, especially now the oil industry seems to have collapsed. Um, no, but the Scots have always had a different view on money. Um, mainly because a lot of the economy was sometimes, you know, you were up in the Highlands, certainly it wasn't a, a rich area. So you had to manage your money more carefully. So what you often had in Scotland were families managing their finances across the family. So that you, whether it was brothers and sisters, uncles and grandparents and things like that, there was someone coordinating it, quite often the family lawyer. Now, actually looking back at what the family lawyer did, did wasn't actually very much, but it was coordinating things like family mortgages uh, and making sure that inheritance was properly managed. And of course, actually, even in those days, education. Um, because up in the Highlands, actually, private education was uh, uh, quite a common thing to be being done, even with relatively small schools. And so families had to always band together to afford the private education. And that's been forgotten. And when you come to England, certainly that was almost, I mean, you don't talk about money in England at all. It's socially unacceptable. What I would like to see is actually families begin to think that they're not just a nuclear family with 2.4 children or whatever the figure is. Actually, most of us belong to a great British institution, the dysfunctional family, which these days consists of husband, wife, second-hand husband, second-hand wife, maybe the occasional single thereafter, and, and a, an array of progeny, which you may or may not be related to, and probably a black Labrador. Now, subject to the blood tests, you could be related to all of those. <laughs> now, uh, let's take that further. The good news is your parents are no longer. Bad news, a little bit too long. Worse news, so are hers. And hers, because you've actually got to include them, because whatever assets they may have, some of it might, with a bit of luck, come to you. So your financial plan should probably include them. Now, what has happened as well, further than that, is because the drugs have all kicked in, the grandparents, by this stage, a number of them would have been whittled away. Nope. Instead, we've got millions of them cluttering up golf courses throughout the countryside, um, and they're not dying. And then when they get to 78, then turn around and say, oh, I've just got a new partner, which is disgusting. I don't want to know about that. Yes, um, <laughs> yes it's so true. <laughs> and it's then, so, and not only that, the ones that really should have gone by now, but we have a special place in Britain for them, known as Worthing, great-grandparents. They think they're on a line of going to New York, but in fact, we've put them in an old people's home in Worthing. And, you know, so we've now got five layers of people with assets um, and all with the wrong financial advice, because it's at least 10 or 20 years out of date, and with a family that's not coordinating. The only people who will benefit from this will be the lawyers and will be the financial advisors. And so long as they can actually treat all of those people individually, they'll make nice bits of money. If the family could get together and coordinate all of that, they will then realize actually their balance sheet is considerably more than they probably thought it was, coordinate the liabilities to help their children in terms of, particularly in Britain, actually be able to afford a house, because certainly if they lived in South East England, that's going to be very difficult for the next generation, afford their education, because not just private education, but university fees and things like that, and afford family old age care, which is going to rocket up in the next few years as well. If we plan all of that, Therefore, you're going to be less dependent upon a state which, no matter what it likes to think, is going to be increasingly incapable of providing those facilities. Well, that's, that's rather heartwarming if you could get people to do that, because families at the moment, uh, 
they don't they only think in in, in terms of the, of the nuclear family don't they they don't, don't really think of the broader family absolutely so that goes back to the point of education so if you could actually start the next generation right. to get them to start thinking about that um, their parents may not appreciate it be bullied by their children as to what's going on but at least the next generation would have a better idea that look I've got to start saving for my my retirement when I'm not well you when you're naught, you probably don't think about it. But if that could be done, I would ban junior ices and things like that in this country. And I would actually say, I want actually compulsory savings from the age of naught for all children. And so that grandparents and godparents can give them money, maybe tax-free to start with. But there is their savings pot from the age of naught. And that can be used to support their university fees. That can be used to be used as a guarantee for their mortgage. That could morph into a retirement fund and can morph into an old age care fund as well. And if you're starting that by order from the age of naught, then our country is going to have a yes. better chance of funding itself. Is anyone doing this stuff? No. And, uh, no country in the world is trying it? Uh, but you've actually had compulsory uh, pensions in Australia, but it hasn't really started from naught yet. Right. And of course, when you then go and talk to our treasury over here, and they're all fearfully bright people who went to your university, um, and they're very bright, but they're not practical. Because I knew the bastards, half the, these people, and, and actually, I, I have to say, they're not a very good advert. Well, the, uh, but the problem is, d- days gone by, remember that lovely series we had of Yes Minister, uh, where you had the, the ageing civil servant, Sir Humphrey Appleby, who had been there for donkey's years. Yes. You go to the civil service, now, there is no Sir Humphrey Appleby, because they, they've adopted modern HR policies. So you spend three years in the Treasury, then three years in the Foreign Office, and three years somewhere else. And so you're fearfully intelligent, an expert in absolutely nothing. So your knowledge of basic finance, of what people need for their finances and how that develops, the knowledge of the financial infrastructure of the country. So for example, now the United Kingdom barely has a stock exchange, so we can barely raise money for new businesses in this country, whereas we used to have 45 stock exchanges in this country after the war. I'm not suggesting we go back to that. But the idea that we need to be able to get more funding mechanisms when the government's proposing things like a a northern powerhouse but a northern powerhouse with no financial engine to it. And this is illogical. And the reason it's illogical is because the people proposing it don't understand the issues. Can I ask you, um, if you're like me, I'm 51. Um, I really have made very, very few investment plans. Um, am I completely stuffed? Is, 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 is there still time for me to do something about my... What would your advice yeah, to me 50, be? 51, you're, you're halfway there. You've got you know, um, our life expectancy now. You're going to be well into your 90s. Um, and so, so you've got another 40 years to go. Over 40 years, you could actually build up a considerable sum of money. Yeah, just ready for when I die. <laughs> <laughs> well, to make sure the old people's home's all right. Yes, um, that, that's, so, that's a good point. Uh, and so th- that's the bit that people really need to take into account. Uh, and th- again, that's why you need to have ca- this sort of cash flow planning so people sort of get an idea of what's going on. No, no, the uh, fift- 51, you, yes, you've left it later but you've still got you've still got a long way to go i, lo- I love that soothing talk you've left it later later, later, later you should have done yes, but, they, yes. but we were we all would have done this uh, and you know uh, at university i managed to leave university with a huge debt without the government giving it to me i managed to achieve that on my own if well someone done. had told me then if i had stopped doing that and put some money aside at that stage yeah, which of course. course you wouldn't have but if someone had almost made you do it um then uh, you would have had a different view overall so in the short term what are you, what are you lo- looking at the markets doing, or is it, is it, are, are you not one for predictions? I mean, for example, gold. Right. Is gold going to go up this year? Now, and like any one of those assets, you sit there and say, I haven't got a clue. What you can say is, I look at the global economy, and despite what the BBC love to tell me at the moment, actually, the global economy is actually not doing too badly. It's growing about 3%. I had a young fellow at the BBC the other day saying, Justin, do you realise I've never seen such appalling economic data in all my life? To which my answer was, yes, that's because you're 12. You, know, you do actually require either some hair or no hair uh, to be able to say, look, take a longer term view as to what's going on. The American economy is not doing badly. The European economy, despite all the issues that are there and the problems that are there, has been growing. But the Chinese economy is still growing. Britain will leave on one side for the time being. Oh, why? Well, there were the issues with regard to Brexit, but because there are all sorts of variations there. The economy is still growing here, but increasingly people are going, um, what happens next? Can I just hold you there, Justin? Are you, are, were you one of those people who voted against Brexit? Absolutely. Oh, my God. I, I've just invited a... A viper to my bosom. <laughs> it, we were getting on so well. I just, I just, can I just say, I think the way that you in the financial sector, you lot, um, talked down Brexit, 
chalk down the chance to, to, to make a break for freedom, like saying, no, you're really much better off in Colditz. We're going to lose the war. Um, the Germans are going to be our masters for the rest of the time. You should stay in this nice, comfy prison. OK, the rations are a bit short and, and you, you're, you're bossed around by the guards and stuff. And, and if you try and escape, they'll shoot you. Um, Herr, Herr Juncker, the, the, the chief guard, will have, have you shot. But trust us. We're the financial people. We know. No, you see, I was with the people who were digging Tom, Dick and Harry, which are the tunnels I was going to be using. So as far as I was concerned, I had allies which were going to be in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, in Hungary and also in Poland. And all those countries that have said, we have not swapped Moscow to be run by Brussels. Those people in Germany who have been turning around saying, oh, excuse me, we've done well out of this, but we're not being told what to do by the people in Brussels. The fact that there was such a will, a well of uh, attitude to change Europe. No, it, wasn't, it, was um, ne it was never going to happen, Justin. Well, there was always that possibility that, that I thought sweet, could try and That change. sweet <laughs> naivety. I mean, that's sort of my little pony version of, 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 of political predictions. <laughs> it was never going to happen. Um, of course, old Europe, uh, as, as, as it became known, countries like what... Um, Poland and stuff were resisting this 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 tendency, but the the EU is unreformable. We had to, we had to get out and look at what the markets have done. Yep. Oh, but this, but the markets, so you say, the markets have done well because of uh, com us coming out of, uh, because of Brexit. And because of the falling pounds. They've done because of the falling pounds, primarily. This and of course, but bear in mind, the FTSE 100 is a market that's got very little to do with the United Kingdom. We don't have no, a UK true. index. Yeah. And one of, one of the problems I've got in this country is we don't have a UK stock market anymore to reflect what's going on. I want to go back to the idea, not so much of having the old stock exchanges. We need to be able to raise more capital for British business. If we really want Britain to survive independently on our own, we need proper funding. Uh, thrive. Methods. Thrive. Thrive. Yeah. Thrive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Where do we get the capital from? In a moment, I've got private equity, too short term, that's three years. Vulture, uh, vel vulture capital, venture capital, that's three years. I've got nothing which is medium term at the moment. Do you, well, yes, we can talk about this a bit. I, we, one of the themes of this, of this, this podcast um, today has been that there is a swamp that needs that needs draining, and given that we accept that central banks are a massive problem, that that the banks generally are a problem because they're a, they're a, an outmoded model and they're deeply corrupt and they charge far too much for doing doing next to nothing. What about the process of disintermi uh, disintermediation or all, all these uh, P2P lending, for example, um, all these? these new banks, sort of independent banks which are coming out, aren't they the bright future? Aren't no. they going to rescue us from this? Now, they're certainly going to provide some of the answers, but like a lot of these ones, the first waves are going to be the ones that are going to cause the problem because they'll be learning what to do and get it wrong. So whether it's peer-to-peer, -peer, crowdfunding, all those sort of elements, there'll be I mean, there's some real disasters in crowdfunding waiting to happen. Having said that, if you do set up a good crowdfunding structure with proper due diligence on the companies, which means 90% of them don't get through, proper due diligence on the investors, which means 90% of them don't get through, um, now you will establish something that looks a bit more like a stock exchange, which is exactly what that should be doing. Um, so good quality crowdfunding will actually provide the mechanism for the new style stock exchanges to come. The bad quality crowdfunding, uh, to me, is a re recipe for ripping people off uh, uh, with money into dodgy investments which are nicely marketed. And this is where you have to be very careful, particularly at shows like this, where you can see some pretty extraneous investments going on. Peer-to-peer -peer lending has a very good place, again, in a regulated environment. The banks are dead in their traditional world, and fine, long may they may they, may they rest because what is the technology is changing it uh, so you don't need the banks in the previous way of before the money transmissions changing and of course the next things will change will be the currencies themselves uh, not so much the things like bitcoin um, but the way that that is going to be structured is going to have a huge change in in time to come so i'm very excited that this could provide a much more vibrant financial services mechanism in the years to come so well, long as people understand it well hang on why not bitcoin what why, why shouldn't we have have um Alternative currencies, which 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 um, governments can't print. Yeah, I mean you, uh, you, you can't debate. Uh, and the answer is you can do. Um, I th it, it's 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 almost the Bitcoin is the first one. Uh, what you need to actually then find is other mechanisms which are probably more understandable. Uh, so the blockchain structure can actually provide alternative currencies for people. So you know it's it's in its early form at the moment. When blockchain really takes off and really becomes sort of more mainstream, I think that will fundamentally change the way we manage our currencies.
Well, why do we even need to understand how, how um, blockchain works? I, 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 I buy my, you know, I buy all my drugs, whatever, whatever I want to from the, from the internet with, 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 with Bitcoin. What, well, what's in, not to like? Well, I don't need to know a blockchain. No, but in the same way, you need to make sure that your your investment, which is involved in houses and mortgages and things like that, doesn't actually have some of that aforementioned unfortunate mortgage poo that was wrapped in it before. We need to understand yeah. the elements of how things are actually working. I, I have to say, one of my biggest worries about my Bitcoin is I, I've, I've got about seven Bitcoin, which is currently worth about seven grand. Yep. But one of the worries is... I, well, sometimes when I go to my Bitcoin wallet, I find the money's disappeared, and I have to I have to reconfigure my Bitcoin wallet in order to make it come, come back. back I hope, and I get very very nervous in the in mm. the interim. So yeah, I can I can see that. But what do you think that? I mean, this is actually a, a Dominic Frisby conversation, really. But I'm going to go try it on you because I, I think it's an endlessly fascinating subject. <laughs> what do you think governments are going to do? If they find they can no longer print money to to um, fund their profligate spending, and this is this is going to be one of the most fascinating issues to try and develop. Start peeling apart the way nations run and national value. If you now have a fiat currency, which is now being challenged by uh, by a, a, a blockchain structure, yeah. uh, therefore, how can you still sustain your fiat? Um, and that's going to be fascinating because, therefore, it, what it's going to then make sure company, countries will have to, governments will have to start pulling back on their expenditure to therefore make sure they can live within their means. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And, uh, and of course, five year governments ever ever successfully done be able to do that. I'm, I, I'm a great believer in market forces hmm. because ultimately market forces are the expressions of the will of, of, of individuals and I believe in, 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 in individuals and I would love to think that technology could solve the problem of government, which is, I think it's almost the biggest problem in the world today, isn't it? Government. Hmm. Yes, so gov governments spending what they haven't got and the money they haven't got actually belongs to people like us. Yes, and, and governments are inherently inefficient. They're not good at controlling expenditure. Um, they're actually going to find themselves in a position where their responsibility has got so big now. Because remember, originally, what was the government there to do? It was there to make sure that the country was secure. Defence of the realm. Defence of the realm. Property rights. Yeah, property rights, and make sure your basic utilities are operating, whether it means actually your drains are working or the lights are on or something like that. Now, oh, of even course, that, yeah. Yeah, but now, of course, it's, it's there. You're supposed to actually make sure you're supposed to be housed, you're supposed to be fed, you're supposed to be all your hospitals, and education, everything's justice. run by the state. <laughs> Social justice enforcement, I mean, yeah. what, what's that all about? Yeah, I mean, so this is, uh, this is ridiculous. So the technology will effectively mean that an awful lot of, bi a lot of uh, government operations could be bypassed, and therefore you wouldn't need to do that. Now, let's take this a stage further. So the individual now operates effectively their own family government expenditure, yep. the family structure, which effectively says, I'm part of Britain, but actually, financially, I'm not going to be a bear, a bear a burden on the state anymore because I'm going to run myself and I will pay to be away from the state I'll pay my dues to say look here's the defense money and here's the the lights on money but the rest of it actually this group is actually going to be away yes I'm paying for my own health care thanks mate, rather than submitting to the kind of atrocities of and, the and the deal is NHS. that of course we don't then have the ability to fall back on the state if things go horribly wrong so we're gonna to have to give some assurance and guarantee to make sure that you know, that could never happen so how do we do that well by making sure that there is some form of strength of value within the within the family within the family government but who, who, who's monitoring this I mean uh, this is the well, that's when it gets there's going to be difficult to try and do so. So how do you actually try and make sure that the people who are saying I'm opting out aren't just lying and actually just going to spend all the money, spend their pension money and come back and lie on the state afterwards? Yes. It needs monitoring and control. But if governments... Maybe, maybe have workhouses again. But that, maybe that's the answer. You have to bring <laughs> back, back poor houses and workhouses. Well, if you were going to find yourself in a position, if we don't, we're not careful anyway, where in the next generation... You know, we've got a position where people don't have pension schemes, they have got nowhere to live, we will effectively be creating workhouses. In fact, they won't be workhouses, they'll, they'll just be death houses. People, yes. where go, people go to where there's nothing for them to do, they're just going to exist, um, and they'll be just in their world watching the television, that's going to be it. You say it could happen if we're not careful. I don't see how we're going to avoid this happening, given given the, the state of understanding of finance in this country, the, given the, the, the model that we've got at the moment. Well, the, the model at the moment, of course, we've actually got a population which is the ageing population, that bubble going through, with a smaller population behind it having to finance the older population. And no, no government at the moment is willing to actually to face the reality of saying, in order to pay for you lot, 
you, your generation, in our case the baby boomer generation, are going to have to fork out a lot more for doing so. Um, because we're also the voting ones at the moment, so no one's going to vote for that. But realistically, that's actually what's going to happen. Because, you know, your children, uh, uh, why should we actually put that burden on them? Quite rightly, you know, they would turn around and say, not my fault, you know, I've just gone into this, you're asking me to actually pay for all of this, I'm earning less, yeah. I have less um, job, job control, um, I haven't got a house anymore that, in the way that you have, an asset going up, so it's illogical. Pe governments have actually got to try and face this and find a way around it, and no one in a democracy at the moment is going to have the strength of character to stand up and say, this is what we're going to have to do. Are you listening? Let this be a warning to all of us. Um, that was a fascinating podcast, though I say so myself. Um, <laughs> thank you very much to my special guest, Justin Urquhart Stewart um, of Seven Seven Investment Management. Is it? Um, you're listening to me, James Dellingpole, on the Dellingpole podcast, brought to you by Breitbart. Thank you very much. Till next week. Bye. <laughs>